Maybe if I just put it in there, maybe. OK, well, thank you all for uh, still being here. Uh, I, we've shrunk a little bit from the first session, I think. Maybe some students will wander in. I want to thank uh, Christelia for uh, inviting me. Uh, I've sort of been thrown to the, the wolves here a little bit in, in that the original uh, both presenter and moderator Bob Browneyes' uh, mother uh, passed away a couple days ago, and Christelia contacted me and asked me if I could step in at the last minute. Um, one thing I've, I've done is to, to try and honor his vision of what this panel would be. The overarching theme of the, the conference, in innovations and incentives in the creative arts, is pretty broad. This is the policy uh, part, which is still <laughs> quite broad. Um, Bob's idea was that, that we might talk about um, uh, and, and a, a part of copyright law where there's actually, I think, some, some middle ground where we have an agreement, where we're not going to have the academics saying information should be free, uh, vote for the pirate party, and uh, the content producer saying uh, uh, you know, there should be death penalty for copyright infringement, and, and uh, Silk and Pipa are, are awesome. The, the area of agreement, uh, or at least potential agreement, that, that he saw uh, really has to do with um, uh, markets for, for copyrighted works and what stands in the way of, of, of licensing and, and voluntary transactions between people who want to use uh, creative works and those who own those creative works, right? So what stands in the way? What sort of data shortages? What sort of bureaucracies? What sort of habits stand in the way of uh, uh, more free transactions? If we have more efficient markets, uh, we have more creative incentives, right? And uh, uh, neither copyright skeptics nor copyright maximalists really doubt that that thicker uh, and uh, cheaper uh, communication uh, markets uh, are a good thing. Now, um, the other uh, uh, the other point of, of Bob's uh, the other issue that that Bob wanted to raise, which is very closely related, is uh, these markets also are going to be more efficient if we know what the the boundaries are, right? We have to know what's protected and what isn't with some degree of certainty in order to know what to contract over and what we can use for free and what we can't. So this notion of reducing barriers to communications between users and owners and uh, more uh, uh, and fine-tuning uh, information about boundaries is sort of what he wanted us to, to approach. And we'll go beyond that, that I'm sure. Uh, but I thought about uh, basically just initially raising the question in my introduction to the panel and uh, my talk by, by uh, maintaining his focus on that. And I think because this is being uh, streamed, I wanted to, uh, and, and the people who are watching might not know who's sitting to my left. Let me mention very, very quickly uh, that we've got, uh, we've got Kim, I think, over there on the far left, Kimberly Isbell, and uh, uh, Jason Everett, uh, John Bergmeier, and then, uh, and then Neil Freed. They're fabulous. You can read all about them in the book, so I won't provide any more introduction than that. So why don't I do is sort of provide three examples, beginning with, with photographs, about uh, what we're talking about and, and how we can approach the policy issues involving um, uh, what we know about the efficiencies and inefficiencies in copyright markets and what policies best nurture uh, those markets. So first problem I want to talk about uh, is a problem that uh, all of us face in, in trying to figure out what photographs we have to pay for and which photographs are free and in the, uh, and in the public domain. So you have this wonderful 1937 photograph. You're all probably familiar with it. You want to use it in your book or article or maybe in your movie or maybe make a poster of it. Um, the reality is it's very, very difficult to learn the name of, of the owner and find out whether it's protected by copyright or not. One problem is copyright office records before 1978 are not online. So you can't go online anywhere and figure out uh, who owns it. And uh, if you go to the copyright office with the photo, you'll have trouble too because uh, uh, copyright uh, because photos are uh, all have a title. That's what they're they're uh, filed under. And and just when you found this great photo in uh, in a in a magazine or a periodical, you don't know what the title you don't know what the title is. And frequently you can't look in that periodical and see who the photographer is either. Now, what you can find out is Corbus will charge you $827 a year to put this photo on your website. We know that, but we don't know, in fact, whether they uh, own the copyright or not, or whether, uh, because, in fact, they license a lot of public domain photos. 
Now, what we do know is the work is probably in the public domain. I haven't checked the, the origin, but it's simply too difficult and expensive for me to do that. It's probably in the public domain just as a statistical, as a statistical uh, uh, matter. And, and by the way, even if you walk into the copyright office with this photo and hand it to the copyright office and say, is this protected or not, they will not be able to tell you because there's no sort of file folder with every single organized photo uh, in it. So let's, let's talk just to, to make the problem yeah, absolutely at its, at its most dire. Uh, let's think about photos taken uh, in the years between 1924 and 1921. So basically, it should actually be 1923 and 1941, about 18 years worth of photos. Um, we have at least one photographer in the audience. Uh, all works from this time period, in order for them to be protected today, have to be registered in the Copyright Office and then renewed. A photo was not registered and renewed. It is in the public domain, and we can use it for free. Um, any guesses as to over this 18-year period, during which time presumably millions and millions of photos were taken, how many photos were registered and reviewed in the Copyright Office? Any guesses at all? You want to guess? 2037. That's it. Right? That's the number of photographs that are registered and renewed uh, for uh, works created during that 18-year period. Now, Corbis offers, if you can do it, Corbis lets you do a search based on when the uh, picture was taken, another famous picture from 1937. They offer 67,578 photos taken from the same period uh, and for uh, uh, offering the same sort of licensing fee for most of those photos. So, so we know, at least we think we know at this point, that it's only a tiny percentage of the photos that are available uh, on Corbis uh, are actually uh, have a copyright owner at all. Now, it's not, unfortunately, not quite that simple uh, because during this period of time, photographers under a, a bizarre copyright fiction under the 1909 Act were uh, assumed to have uh, assigned the copyright in their work to a periodical or magazine if it appeared in a periodical or magazine or book or other kind of collective work. So um, uh, if those works were published with notice, in other words, if the periodical, the magazine, or the newspaper was published with notice, and it was registered and renewed, then the periodical, or the newspaper, or the, the book owner would actually be the owner of the copyright and the, photo and the photograph, not, uh, not the photographer, unless the photographer actively managed to get the copyright back. If you look at renewal rates uh, over this period of time, it's about 10% for periodicals and other collective works. So we might be able to add maybe another 6,000 photos to this period that uh, may still be protected because they're caught under this, this strange and annoyingly uh, arcane uh, copyright, copyright doctrine. Now, what's interesting is the people who fight against, we'll talk about orphan works in just a second, the people who fight against uh, orphan works legislation, the most are photographers. And I used to think it, I used to think it was because they had, there were so many old photographs that were still protected and they wanted to uh, maintain control over them. I now have come to believe that it's because uh, they don't want anybody to know that virtually all this stuff has fallen into the public domain. Now, uh, why does it matter that we, that we have a nice clear boundary that we know, or we can tell? what's in the public domain, what's protected by copyright. Because if it's protected by copyright, we want to pay the photographer. We want to give him a nice licensing fee if he's the copy or he or she is the copyright, uh, copyright owner. Uh, if it's in the public domain, we don't want anybody to, uh, uh, to, to be paying for that photograph because, in fact, the lack of legal protection creates affirmative uh, economic value. And I uh, wrote a paper on this which has 50 slides. I only have two of them here, so you're going to have to take take this with a lot of salt, but there's two ways of sort of measuring uh, the value that the lack of legal rights in, in, in uh, public domain photographs creates on, on Wikipedia. One way to look at it is to look at the costs Wikipedia page builders save by not having to pay licensing fees. So the, uh, I'm probably going to turn this off just like Mark here. So um, we've got, at the time I did the study, uh, about four and a half million total Wikipedia pages. We took a nice big sample of them. Uh, half of Wikipedia pages have an image on them. We looked at the provenance of the images, and 87% of the images are in the public domain. So we got approximately 2 million public domain images on Wikipedia. Uh, the average Corbis and Getty charges per year to a nonprofit to have a, uh, one of their images uh, on, the, on a, uh, a web page is between $105 and $117. Uh, dollars. 
So if you multiply that by, by two million, you get cost savings of between 208 million and 232 million dollars a year. This is undoubtedly way too high, right? Because if in fact we, 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 we uh, uh, forced Wikipedia to pay licenses to Corbis and Getty, they have enough bargaining power, they could, they could, they could talk Corbis and Getty down probably a, a whole lot. So this is too much, but it still suggests a significant uh, value in the public domain status of these images. Um, what's more fun is to think about the value added to Wikipedia due to increased traffic because of the presence of the public domain photos. We know that uh, the Google search engine, which drives 98% of traffic on the internet, is sensitive to the presence of an image. We know if a website has an image or a page has an image, it's more likely to have traffic directed to it. Uh, Google, of course, doesn't tell us <laughs> how much because their search engine is proprietary. But in the interesting part of the paper, we reverse engineer the Google, uh, the, the Google uh, uh, search algorithm and come up with uh, a figure of 19% extra traffic, which gets driven by the presence of an image. So if you want to do this math, we've got the, the same uh, four and a half million number of wiki pages. Again, half of them have images. 87% of those images are the public domain. Um, what we're going to try to do is put a monetary value on that traffic. And, and we'll use advertising value as a proxy. Wikipedia doesn't advertise, but they could charge. And uh, a lot of people have studied what, what would the advertising value be of a single Wikipedia page view. The number of estimates, we take the lowest estimate, which is half a cent, point zero zero five three dollars that, that, That's the advertising value of a Wikipedia page view. So we multiply uh, uh, this by the number of average page views per page. It's an astoundingly high number. Uh, but that's what uh, our random sample uh, showed. And then our magic 19% uh, which is the percentage of the traffic uh, increases that we find that is uh, presumably, <laughs> hopefully, due to the presence of the image. And you get uh, about uh, a $37 million per year traffic value. Um, so it matters, right? Knowing whether uh, a photo is in the public domain or not really uh, matters, and, and real uh, measurable uh, economic value is, is lost when uh, an image when the provenance of an image cannot be determined and it can't be, can't be used. Um, what's the solution? This is the policy panel, right? Um, I really like the, the solution proposed, or I should say supported, by the Copyright Office back in 2008. It's the, the Sean Bentley Orphan, Orphan Works Act, which would uh, essentially, if you wanted to use a, a photograph or, or, or some other work that you think might be copyrighted, you do a diligent search. You try as hard as you can to find the owner. And for all of the reasons that we can blame the horrible Copyright Office registration system, you can't find the owner. Then you can go ahead and use the work. But if the owner appears, right? if the owner, uh, if the owner uh, comes out of the woodwork and says, hey, you're using my stuff, then you have to pay a reasonable royalty for the work, uh, which seems, in fact, fairly reasonable. It, you, it's, uh, yes, it's a forced transaction, but we are paying the the person who was the uh, uh, victim of the orphan, the orphan works uh, solution. There, we've got a recent copyright office uh, uh, publication which supports uh, not exactly the Sean Bentley Act, but something close, close to it. So here's a potential policy solution, um, which solves not only uh, which solves the, which solves not only a boundary problem. Uh, but also uh, encourages, uh, encourages uh, transactions or, or sort of forces transactions. And uh, we might talk about the ways that this could be made to work uh, even more efficiently. Okay, second problem, sound and video recordings. Um, so this is, I got a little arrow there. This is a pro Procol Harum's A Whiter Shade of Pale, if you may remember this from, I think it was from 1970, 43 million views at this point. It's been monetized. When I first found this, there was 30 million views and it had not been monetized. Um, the copyright owners had, had not attempted to collect any money from, uh, uh, any money from, from YouTube. So this was posted by uh, Meow Bay, uh, not the copyright <coughs> owner. You click on Meow Bay, you see all sorts of stuff which would suggest, in fact, Meow Bay uh, is neither the owner of the copyright in the video uh, or in the sound recording or in the underlying underlying composition. Um, why is this still, uh, why was this up for five years, 30 million views without any, uh, anybody complaining about it, without any takedown notice being filed? 
Um, there's a couple of, uh, a couple of possibilities. Um, one, uh, you know, the, the owner of the composition may just be fine with it being out there. It may, he may, in fact, sell more uh, copies of the sheet music because 30 million people have been reminded uh, of the song. Um, my guess is, as far as the video recording goes, this is somebody who uh, filmed this off of his television, right? The, the, the television studio that produced this little, this little uh, sort of uh, proto music video back in the early 70s undoubtedly has re erased the tape. So we, we literally have thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of hours of television, valuable television episodes that's only in the hand of private parties because the original copyright owner uh, erased all versions. So there's only one, ver there's only one Jack Parr episode extant. Everything else is erased because it was just the, the, the way uh, TV studios work. So what YouTube does, or it creates this opportunity for people who have content to post it online, uh, make it available uh, when it otherwise would not be available, and it gives the copyright owners the power almost instantly to take it down through the content ID function. If you are a music uh, owner of a music copyright, uh, you provide the music to, uh, to YouTube, and uh, every day you will uh, receive notice of people who've uploaded uh, something that's infringing, and if you want to set up an automatic takedown, you can. You don't have to reply to, uh, uh, to the emails. It provides not a legislative solution to the problem of all this content that we would like to have access to, but people are too afraid to post. Uh, but it provides a private ordering solution. It's a platform where people who have content can get content to people who want it and transact really, really costlessly with the content owner. So you put the content owner completely in control of what's, of what's up there on YouTube through Content ID, exceedingly cheap. And, and essentially, you, you force a conversation and, and a transaction between three different parties. Um, and the content owner doesn't like it, uh, it comes down. So this is sort of a private organization to a very similar problem. Think about it. If you, you, know, you had a romantic honeymoon with your spouse, and you want to post pictures of it in the background, you want some sappy song. Okay? Trust me, you cannot get the attention of the copyright owner in the sappy song to get permission. All right? Your, your emails will go unanswered. You can't do it. So, what, so you post it. All right? You post it. The next day, if the uh, music owner has registered with Content ID, they'll know that you did this. If they don't like it, it'll come down immediately. But guess what? They might like it. They might leave it up. They frequently do. Right? The owners of music copyright vary, and I've d done a, another study that they talk about very, very frequently leave up stuff that they think actually will increase sales. So your, your romantic uh, honeymoon may, may stay up uh, with the uh, tacit permission of the, of the copyright owner. You see, you've essentially transacted, you've done a deal with the copyright owner you've never met, you've never talked. Uh, Content ID makes it, makes it possible. So there are private ordering solutions in addition to legislative solutions. Uh, another kind of policy solution. Uh, third problem, and then I'll stop, is a problem I don't have a solution for and maybe we can talk about. Uh, this is a, a survey, uh, a, a random sample I took of t over 2,300 books on, on Amazon uh, by decade of initial publication of the book. So not surprisingly, we've got quite a bit of stuff published between 2000 and 2010. Steep drop off to 1990, super steep drop off to 1980. Almost nothing in print mm -hmm. uh, from the 1980s in the sample. Uh, you've got all these, these missing uh, books here that are copyrighted, but are not in print. The moment they fall out of copyright in 1923, you get this massive spike. So you have all of these books uh, on Amazon being sold uh, that were originally printed in the 1910s, 1900s, uh, 1890s, because once a, once a work loses its copyright status, it becomes available and accessible to us, to us again. Um, so what do we do? What do we do with all the missing books uh, that we'd like to see? Um, legislative solution, I can't think of one. Private ordering, I can't think of one. Um, can we rely on the book publishing business to get these books out to us? Maybe in ebook form, because it's cheaper to publish ebooks. They don't actually have to publish you know, physical books. Uh, can they put them out in ebook form? They don't. Uh, I've done a study showing there's really uh, no market for ebooks uh, for major publishers where there isn't actually an, a real printed edition. They just don't do that. And Smith, Talang, and Zhang at, at Carnegie Mellon did a nice study where they estimate that there's $740 million just left on the table by, uh, by book publishers uh, ignoring the ebook market for all of these books that are out of, out of print. It's just odd because you normally think of publishers as being pretty rational and why would they leave money on the table. 
Um, the answer is in these incredibly obsolete business models, which, which are actually one major reason why the, the publishing business is, is in, such, uh, in such dire straits. So what do you do when the, when the, when the access problem, when the transaction problem uh, is caused by obsolete business models? Is there, uh, what's, what's the solution? I'll throw that out to our, uh, to our panelists and stop there and see if we can uh, get the conversation going in another perhaps completely <coughs> radically different direction. And now I step into my moderator role. Um, <laughs> and I, 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 I told Neil that, that uh, he might have the first word since he's the only other person with, with slides. And then we'll be done looking at slides. And, and with apologies, so I had talked uh, with Professor Pronice about a rather different presentation uh, about voluntary initiatives. But I don't want to short circuit this conversation. So maybe we'll come back to that before we're done. Um, I'll just make a few observations. Um, first, I'm with the Motion Picture Association. And since I'm working with motion pictures, I don't have a lot to say about still pictures. Um, but Orphan Works is an issue uh, of importance to us. And I make several observations that what many people don't realize is that the motion picture industry is both a creator and a user of copyrighted content. So things like fair use, things like Orphan Works are very important to us. Uh, the first observation I would make is that uh, the universe of Orphan Works should be shrinking. Our data is getting better. Uh, information about newer works are much less likely to be lost. Um, they're still not easy to search. Um, and again, talking about my own particular uh, occupation, um, there are very few orphan worked movies. It's usually pretty easy to figure out who created the movie. Um, but what I would observe is, is that um, we, uh, we have no opposition uh, to an orphan works legislative strategy, so long as there is still a requirement for a diligent and reasonable search. That the answer can't simply be, I did a Google search. I didn't see who the owner was, <laughs> so I've got carte car blanche to post it. So there needs to be some mechanism for making sure you're looking at both uh, government-run and non-government-run sources to make sure you have done a diligent search on who uh, the creator is. Um, uh, if, in, if you do not find the creator at the time, but you do find the creator later, um, one would hope that you then engage in a legitimate transaction with that creator having found them and make sure they are given a reasonable licensing fee that they might otherwise have gotten had they been found at the time. Um, what we really want to make sure we do is we don't short circuit that licensing process. The whole principle behind copyright is that it incentivizes the creation in the first place. And as we talked about in previous panels, you want to make sure you remunerate the individuals who put that effort in to encourage them to further create and so that they can actually continue to, to have a living and invest back in the next creation. Um, when it comes to the content ID technology, we very much like the content ID technology because it facilitates an after the fact problem. Once someone has posted content that they probably shouldn't have, you can now have an opportunity to, to remove that content or in some cases in a valuable way, get the conversation that should have happened in the front end that the, the user of the content, the creator of the content, can engage in a transaction. Is this a, a use that we both uh, find value in and come up with some sort of uh, market-based arrangement to compensate? But I wouldn't want it to suggest that we should use the content ID system as a sort of a, a, prior, a prior authorization to use the content. Right? So what, what really content ID is doing is it's helping uh, implement the safe harbor provisions that we've talked about in the previous panel that the, the ISP, the entity that's, the, the platform that's put this content up is not held culpable um, so long as they take that content down. That doesn't mean that the person who has posted the content doesn't have some obligation not to have violated a copyright. So as long as we're talking about using content ID in the, in the second half to redress the problem, I think we're comfortable with that. I wouldn't want to suggest that we could replace all of copyright with a post hoc redress based on a content ID system. Um, Again, this is not sort of the focus of, of, of my presentation or what um, I have the expertise in, so let me just turn it over to other panelists and maybe we'll come back to some of the other topics that we were going to talk about. Sure. Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, solutions, and I think uh, a big problem is it's as retroactive solutions are never going to be perfect. Uh, you're either going to uh, irritate people like me 
uh, where you're retroactively <laughs> extending terms, and uh, I don't think that's fair because people are getting an unbargained for uh, benefit, or you're taking away something at, at the time of creation. There's going to be some people who you know created a work, and you're somehow reducing the right that they had at the time they created it. So I think really an orphan works type solution, which is a little bit messy because you have to say it's based on a diligent search, and then you have to define it. I mean, that is a messy solution. It's not totally satisfactory. But I think for the existing problem for works that have already been created, I kind of think that's the best you can do. Uh, however, we also need to think prospectively. It's like, OK, how do we make it so there's not a similar problem uh, 80 years from now? And I think that is much easier to fix. Uh, and unfortunately, there's almost zero attention paid to potential mechanisms that would uh, fix that. Uh, I'll just throw one out there. I am a big believer that you should have renewal formalities. Uh, so there's always problems with the Berne Convention. But you know we have a formalities-free uh, system now when you create a work and it is uh, copyrighted at the moment of fixation and there's no record of it anywhere and you have billions of uh, copyrighted photographs being taken every day on people's smartphones. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's great and it's fine and all those things uh, should continue to have copyright protection. But you know, after a certain term of years, I think we should have a way for economically unvaluable works to pass into the public domain and have at least a token uh, necessity of registration, which both would ensure that more works are passing into the public domain uh, that are no longer economically fruitful for their creators, while simultaneously for those works which are still subject to copyright protection, solving the orphan works problem by creating more of a paper trail. Uh, I think the concept of formalities uh, fell out of favor in the copyright world uh, decades ago, and uh, there are some people who still think that the idea is a terrible one, but I think it's a good way to solve a lot of problems at the same time. And, I think we should not uh, hesitate to think of things like that when we're looking to solve problems on a, on a prospective basis, at least. I actually want to jump in there, um, because it's actually not quite true that no one's <coughs> thinking about this. Uh, the Copyright Office is very much thinking about this. In fact, um, it's a large part of the thinking that's going into um, Register Plante's Copyright Office modernization efforts. And you know, we've certainly heard the calls for bringing back formalities. Unfortunately, there are a number of treaties out there that impose international obligations on the United States that say you can't condition um, copyright protection on formalities. So, well, you can on U.S. works, though, right? I mean, on the U.S. works, yeah. But um, you know, in politically, trying to say that we're going to put a higher burden on U.S. creators then we're going to on foreign creators. I mean, Jason can certainly step in if he disagrees with that. I think that's a very difficult sell. Um, and so taking the system that we have today, what we're trying to look at is how can we fix this problem going forward? Obviously, we have a retroactive solution that we're proposing, Orphan Works um, legislation, but going forward, one of the things we've identified is that there is um, this lack of information. And part of it, honestly, is because the Copyright Office, um, up until now, has very much been a 20th century institution. It was you know, built on paper. We still currently do the recordation system on paper. It's not electronic. Um, even though it's 2016. Um, just to step back, a sec, there are two sides of um, copyright recordals at the Copyright Office. There's registration, so that's when you initially say, this is my work, I'm claiming it. And then there's recordation, when you come back to the Copyright Office and say, um, I've licensed this, I've sold it, I've granted an exclusive interest. Um, registration, not surprisingly, has much more uptake um, just because if you want to sue someone, you have to have a registration in hand. Um, if you want to license your work, you don't have to tell the Copyright Office about it. Um, so what we are currently thinking about is how do we improve the data we have? How do we encourage and incentivize people to provide data, to come to us and tell us, hey, I've sold it, hey, I've licensed it, hey, you know, there's a new exclusive licensee out there, um, I've granted a security interest. How do we get that information? 
Um, we have some ideas. We um, are open to hearing other ones, but you know, one thing we've identified going forward is we have a really huge IT plan that we just released earlier this week, actually, um, that talks about completely re-engineering the recordation and rec um, registration systems, tying them in together. Currently, they're, they're totally separate databases. You've got to look in two different places. Um, tying them in together, standardizing metadata along industry standards so that we can accept into our systems the data that the content owners and licensees are already creating in the native formats in which they're being created and making it much more seamless to get that information into the copyright office and then into the public records and then out to the public. Um, and creating APIs so that if you have a project and you want to download all of the information the Copyright Office has about all works from you know, 1980 to 1990, you can plug into our system, download it, look at the data, play with it, do what you want. Um, is it perfect? Um, no. But the hope is that the more you reduce the friction for engaging in these transactions with the Copyright Office, the more likely that content owners and licensees and others in industry will engage in those transactions and will provide the data, and then we can then make the data available going forward. Um, so that's one of our proposals. Um, we are open to other ones. We have various notices of information out, um, notices of inquiry out, um, seeking comments on the strategic plan. It just came out March 1. Um, if you have ideas about how to do this, how to build this technology, what the technology should look like, please, please um, share your ideas with us. We're looking for that. Um, and we're looking for other creative ways of answering this question going forward. But it is very much something that is on our minds. We recognize it's an issue. Um, you know, we wouldn't have had to do a several hundred page orphan works report if this information had been there. Um, and you know, we would like that the people who are here 20 years after us aren't having to do the same report. Um, so. I think I'll stop there. Uh, so I'm Jason Everett. Um, I'm here talking about the perspective from Congress. Um, I'm the Chief Democratic Counsel for the Subcommittee on Courts, Intellectual Property, and the Internet. And so for many of you are probably aware that Congress has been engaging in a uh, comprehensive review of the copyright laws uh, that began in 2013, uh, led by uh, Chairman Goodlad and uh, Ranking Member Conyers. Uh, we have gone through, uh, you know, we've had over 20 hearings on all the different issues within the copyright, well not all of the issues, but many of the issues uh, within the copyright code uh, with over 100 witnesses and we're trying to identify solutions for many of the problems that we've uh, discussed here so far. Uh, as was men as mentioned by Kimberly, I think what a lot of members uh, have identified is the fact that uh, the copyright office is, is, is improving and trying to do a better job, but their current finance, financial structure as well as um, their placement within the Library of Congress presents many challenges um, with the changing technolo technological developments that have occurred uh, since it was originally placed within the Library of Congress. And so what the committee's review process is designed to do is to kind of sort the competing interests that we've kind of heard today, uh, which, has, which can be a challenge um, for a lot of members of Congress because they're focused on so many issues and we're trying to focus them on why this is um, important and uh, potentially needs to be addressed. Now, there's many people I know out there, uh, when I said Congress, I could see people shaking their heads, <laughs> uh, you know, giving me the thumbs down, saying, don't, don't do anything, uh, which, which is part of the reason why we had, uh, you know, listening sessions that for the members in different places in the country. They went to Nashville as well as uh, Silicon Valley in LA to meet with uh, practitioners as well as experts to kind of get an idea of there are certain areas of the law should, should be tweaked and what should be left alone should the courts decide certain things. Uh, on the orphan works issue, uh, as was mentioned previously, uh, there was, for those that were following the issue, in 2008 it was pretty close to getting done uh, the bill that's, that's mentioned here. A lot of people when we've gone over the country or we've members, they've discussed with members, they've kind of wanted to know uh, 
what's the status of that? Is that something that, that could get done? Uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, the Copyright Office and their testimony before members of Congress pointed out that they believe that there's a sufficient you know, body of evidence based off of the examples that were given here as well as what they've heard from the stakeholders that there should be a legislative solution that could be crafted as long as, as Neil mentioned, uh, there's a dil diligent search performed and I do think that members are interested in solving this issue. Now before, uh, you know, back in 2008 that, that predated a lot of other issues that occurred in Congress as well as our review. So now where we are is trying to, trying to figure out what pieces of legislation can be included and whether it should be an overall package or whether it should be uh, individual pieces of legislation and I anticipate that a decision will be made on that shortly. Uh, but I say all that to say that uh, Congress has been grappling with uh, the issues that were discussed on the first two panels, um, particularly uh, trying to make sure that we can maintain a framework of laws that makes it worthwhile for people to invest their time, uh, labor, and talent, kind of what was mentioned by uh, Melvin Gibbs on the last panel. We've heard from a lot of creators uh, that have concern about what the future of these things will mean uh, if they're not able to receive um, adequate compensation. So that is something that we're trying to address in Congress. This actually might be a good segue into what I had talked with Professor Bronice about discussing. So I'll take it that way and okay. hopefully that will foster the next round of the conversation. And so uh, what, what we discussed about addressing is uh, at least what the Motion Picture Association sees as we look into the, the copyright review process as is copyright law working, what should we be doing next? in the next phase as we move into a, a digital era. Um, so I started with first premises, right, which is the, the Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, and the Copyright Act do actually a terrific job of promoting creativity and innovation. It gives creators an incentive to publicly disseminate their content, uh, <coughs> which benefits the public, and also generates for them a return on their investment so they can continue to create. And that was some of the conversation we had in the last panel, and then there's a debate about, well, is it just enough compensation that they can earn a living, or should they actually be benefiting from their labors, and that others shouldn't be benefiting from their work without compensating them? Um, the other great thing about the Copyright Act is it, it, in recognizing the property right in your works, it creates a marketplace. And once you have a marketplace, content creators, distributors, and audiences can enter into a whole variety of relationships in that marketplace contracting relationships, licensing relationships, subscription relationships that evolve as technology changes, as consumer expectations change. And perhaps, perhaps the best example is digital uptake. So um, it's working, right? In, today, there's now more than 115 legal online sources for accessing video content, televisions and movies. And in just 2014 alone, that one year, 66.3 billion television episodes accessed lawfully online in that single year and 7 billion movies lawfully in that one year. And that shows that the incentives in the act work. Um, the, the movie and television industry was criticized early on for not embracing technology. Uh, it was the excuse, um, we don't think a very good one, but well, we can't find it lawfully online, so that's why we have to steal it. Clearly that's not the case anymore. The content is rapidly becoming available and these numbers continue to go up. Um, notwithstanding the availability of content, theft is still a problem. So um, just in traffic, 24%, about a quarter of the internet's bandwidth is dedicated to distribution of content without authorization, all content. This is um, books, movies, photos. A staggering amount of the internet is dedicated to infringing activity. Search, so 74% of consumers said they used a search engine the first time they found infringing work, and almost half of those queries were not actually looking for pirated content. They were just looking for either a movie time or if it was available lawfully, yet they were steered to unlawful, uh, unauthorized distributions of the content. Um, we, we got a bit into this in the last panel. Should, should copyright be about uh, letting someone earn a living or making sure that others are not improperly benefiting from the work of others. Cyber lockers, a hundred million dollars per year made in unauthorized distribution of content. They have made a very big business and have huge margins because guess what? The hundreds of millions of dollars that people spent to make the movie 
aren't their costs. They have almost zero input costs, which means everything they make is almost, almost everything they make is profit. Where is that money coming from? Advertising. Pirate sites make approximately 200 million a year in advertising. Um, huge, again, without the input costs, huge profit margins. Um, and there are other um, non-intellectual property related harms. Uh, malware. Um, about a third of pirate sites have links that direct you to, um, uh, to viruses, to other malware. We have real problems here. And I might add that there's a huge benefit in taking steps to curb this. Um, one perfect example, Mega Upload. When Mega Upload was brought down, there was a 6.5 to 8.5% increase in lawful transactions to just three studios over 12 countries. So when you do take down the unlawful, you actually facilitate the lawful markets, all very important. Well, so how do we facilitate uh, encouraging the lawful markets? Well, enforcement will always be a part of it. But collaboration actually is something that we're focused on right now. We're not actually looking for a major overhaul of the Copyright Act. Um, and we've been conveying that in, in the review. Um, sure, there'll be some discussions around the edges, but our, our emphasis really is on collaborative efforts. So the great thing about the internet, right, is it is a decentralized platform. No one controls it. Anybody can contribute to the content. Anybody can contribute to the architecture. The downside of that is that when no one entity controls it, no one entity can solve a problem when it arises, right? So it's not, it's not the usual direct transit, transaction where the content owner sells it to the consumer. On the internet, right, you have the content creation. You have a search engine that leads to its discovery. It's got to go over a network. There's a payment processor usually involved, right? There's some, someone is charging something, either it's an advertising transaction or a subscription transaction. There's a payment processor somewhere in there facilitating that transaction. There are registrars that are giving domain names to people that are essentially their storefronts. There are advertising networks. All of these parties are involved in almost every transaction involving content. And the only way we're really going to make uh, a dent in the unlawful uh, markets is through collaboration through these groups. And the good news is it's starting to happen. Um, so uh, ISPs, the, the Internet Service Providers, have entered into, into a voluntary arrangement, the Copyright Alert System with content creators where if they notice, and this is completely anonymous, this is not information, we're not given the, inf the identity of people that are doing this, but if someone is, in, is improperly engaging in the distribution online of content, the subs we, we sort of let the ISPs know what, con we notice the transaction, you know, a copy of the movie is showing up on a website. The ISP can determine where did that distribution originate, and if it's their subscriber, they notify the subscriber, hey, you may not realize this, but that was, that was not lawful. It may be your teenager down in the basement, but something is happening in your household that shouldn't be happening. And it's an education platform. There's, there's no removing of content. There's no penalties of, of, of jail or, or fines. It's just an attempt to make sure that when, un, when illicit activity is happening, the ISP plays a role in trying to keep their part of the ecosystem clean, and it's working well. Payment processors. We recently entered into an agreement with, um, uh, 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 these are one-on-one -on -one agreements, but with MasterCard, with Visa, with PayPal, where when we can identify for them, and there are certain telltale signs, particularly with cyber lockers, that there's an illegal transaction going on, the payment processors agree, I'm not going to be in the business of facilitating an unlawful transaction. So the payment processor is saying, all right, I'm going to look at my part of the ecosystem, and I'm not going to facilitate on, uh, illegal activity. Registrars and registries are now stepping up. I don't know if many people noticed, but there's the Healthy Domain Name Initiative recently launched by the registrars and registries. And uh, there's a recent agreement between Donuts, which is, despite the name, actually in the business of making domain names available to the public. The new ones, the, the global uh, domain names, not the dot coms, but the next round of them. And they have agreed that with, with a very concrete, detailed analysis of a website being used for unlawful purposes, they, in their relationships in licensing and essentially putting these domain names in the hands of people, will say, hey, guys, you're doing something unlawful. You need to stop. And if they, if they, in their own independent analysis, have determined that there is, in fact, pervasive unlawful activity like piracy happening on a website, they will take back the domain name. Um, advertising networks. Uh, there's a, a trustworthy advisory group. It's an a, a attempt to come up with best practices. Many brands don't realize that their advertising is ending up on unlawful sites. That's not good for us because it's now paying the pirates essentially to steal our content. It's not good for them because if consumers are going there and they're being subjected to malware or it's, it's an unseemly site that's engaged in illegal activity, the brand is harmed. Um, unfortunately, because of the complexity of the internet, 
the brand may not realize that their ad is showing up. There's a whole network, an advertising network. They just say, we want to hit you know, uh, men between 13 and 35. Someone else places it. It may be that there are a lot of 13 to 35 year olds going to a pirate site. The brand doesn't really realize that. The, the goal here is that the advertising entities themselves will make sure that they're not placing lawful ads on illegitimate sites. All of this is essentially the follow the money approach. It's a voluntary mechanism to try and crack down on the illegitimate market so that, in, back in the first slide, the, the legitimate market can continue to thrive. So our emphasis really at the MPAA now is on these sorts of voluntary initiatives. Um, we're making some progress. There's a lot more to do. Yeah, so I find this particularly fascinating because, you know, SOPA and PIPA did not pass, right? And a lot of the same corporate entities that, you know, complained about the legislation are now cooperating voluntarily in such a way that the result is, you know, mimics at least to a certain extent what that proposed legislation was supposed to do. So you have a private ordering, you know, solution here uh, between, you know, technologically advanced firms who can actually anticipate problems and solve them probably more quickly than the Copyright Office. I mean, you, you all are doing amazing. I mean, there's been so much progress in the Copyright Office and just in the last 18 months that they're had in the last 18 years probably. But it's a lot harder for you, you know, to go through the bureaucratic process. You write the report, you go talk to, to Jason and see if you can sell your, your perspective in Congress and, you know, five or six years later maybe something happens. Um, and I'm just wondering in general whether you, whether you, you, you all in general have more faith in, uh, in the market solving some of these problems than in uh, legislatures. Or I mean, administrative agencies. For us, we definitely agree that there is a lot of room for um, private ordering and industry agreements. Um, we think in many situations the law can be tweaked to make that easier. Um, you know, one example that we use um, is music licensing right now is so complex, so many layers. Uh, our general counsel has this chart that she puts up showing all of the entities that have a piece of that pie. And it's, it's the type of system that no rational person would ever sit down and create. But it's, you know, as John discussed at lunch, it's sort of the accretion of little tweaks over time ends up with a monster. Um, and it becomes so much more difficult to have private ordering in a situation like that because there's so many players and everyone has a little different piece of the pie and you have to get so much agreement among very disparate actors that it makes it much harder. And so one of the things we've recommended is okay, let's rationalize that system. Let's, you know, pretend that we actually want to create a coherent system that leaves room for individual parties to contract and to, you know, not have a DOJ um, antitrust agreement that sort of forces their hand as to how they have to do this. Um, and so I think there's a lot of room for decreasing the complexity of the law to make it easier for these types of um, individual activities to spring up and have room to breathe and not be strangled in their crib. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the music licensing example is a very good segue uh, to a note that I had written weeks ago, <laughs> uh, which is, uh, you know, private ordering uh, can be great. Different markets for media seem to have different characteristics. Like, for example, with music, there is this very strong tendency where music services, radio stations, the current generation of online streaming services feel like they need to have lots of music or even all of music, a substantial part of the catalog. And obviously, if you had to individually negotiate with each songwriter and performer, that's not scalable. So back in the early days of radio, when you didn't even have sound recording rights, you just had the publishing rights, uh, publishing societies developed. Well, when you have a lot of different uh, private actors who sort of decide to start working together <laughs> to set rates and terms of deals, I mean, there's a name for that. It's a cartel. But at the same time, it's a it was a necessary cartel because it's like, well, radio stations were like, well, we're, what are we going to do? <laughs> we need to have very few deals to sign. There needs to be a cartel, but cartels are a problem. So the solution was, well, you can do it, but it's going to be subject to court oversight. 
might not be the ideal solution. In other areas where collective licensing becomes required, you just have a statutory uh, license. But that's not ideal either because you end up with rate courts. And how do you have uh, a rate court you know, determining what a market rate would be in some hypothetical alternate universe? Uh, but the interesting thing, though, is that's confined to one area of uh, media. And I, I find that fascinating that there are these business models now where uh, I think a lot of people would have thought uh, a long time ago that to be a successful video business, uh, you had cable television, and then you had basically satellite, which was pretty much the same. And then you have you know these IPTV providers like Verizon and AT&T and now Google Fiber. And they all basically offer pretty much the same product. But it's working out di very differently online, where instead you have these different, mu these different video services that are cheaper, so you can actually afford to subscribe to multiple uh, different services, the way they work means you can subscribe to multiple different services because they're all available to you. And they don't all have the same content. There's some overlap, but they have some exclusives. Uh, and that's really not seen as a problem. So just sort of looking at the ways that uh, the, the dynamics and the consumer preference for different kinds of media inform you know, these policy problems because in, maybe in these other areas of media, you know, these antitrust-like problems don't even occur. Uh, I was going to say that. Uh on the idea of kind of what Neil laid out with the slide that had all the different players there. I think uh, in September of 2013, uh, there was a hearing that just dealt with voluntary agreements, uh, which had members of different uh, you know, sectors that came to testify about how they'd been working together. And I think you know, it was mentioned earlier about uh, SOPA and other legislation in the past, which I guess kind of from the perspective of people outside of DC had you know, tech, not tech companies on one side and content companies on the other, and they're warring against each other and things. But I think what uh, members of Congress have kind of learned from trips across the country and just meeting and hearing is that, with, in hearings, is that actually there's a lot of collaboration that has been going on between the different parties. And I think, you know, the members of Congress have been encouraged by a lot of the, the actions that have been taking place um, and trying to understand if there's still some areas in there. Uh, where there would be some legislation that would be needed. As Neil alluded to, uh, there are a lot of uh, organizations and, and individuals and creators that are saying, hey, look, uh, we, we, we're more worried about what you could potentially do than uh, the, the help that you could give to us. So just focus on modernizing the Copyright Office. If you make the Copyright Office stronger uh, through increased funding or uh, either potentially making the, uh, the register of copyright, you know, the register um, a Senate appointed position, uh, which might help with the structure or doing other things like that, that might improve uh, the ability of content creators and others, their interaction with the Copyright Office, that uh, could be seen as an improvement. And so I think members are recognizing that there's been development uh, as Neil outlined, and that's an encouraging step, and uh, it's something that we as staff and uh, members are looking at as an improvement. Okay, I feel like we're not fighting enough. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so maybe let me throw out one question before we go out, maybe and get some questions from from you all. Um, the one question that fascinates me is, what do you do with owners who won't transact when they when they probably should because their their business models are are, are obsolete? Now, just as an example, I did a, a study of a, of a, a, what books had been made into audio books, and I looked at. Uh, Books originally published between 1913 and 1932, because this, there's a magic date, 1923, where every book published before that is in the public domain, and every book published afterwards, at least in my sample, still protected by uh, by copyright. And what we found was that um, twice as many of the public domain uh, titles were had an audio book, and if and if you then the copyrighted titles. Uh, but more interestingly, if you looked at just the, the 20 best sellers on either side of the divide, uh, the 20 best sellers from 1913 to 22 all had audiobooks. Uh, and there's a lot of pretty boring best sellers from that time that you wouldn't recognize actually some of the titles. Whereas the 20 best sellers from 1923 to 32, which you would all recognize, had less than 60% audiobooks, right? So there's, there is undoubtedly a market. For these audiobooks, uh, and the the owners of the the underlying copyright are either unwilling to uh, license an audiobook company to, to make an audiobook, or more likely, um, more likely the deal is too small. A lot of the business models I referred to 
uh, prevent these companies from doing any kind of a deal if the, if the dollar amount falls uh, below a certain level. Um, outside the book context, I had a friend in Europe who wanted to buy the back catalog of a large European uh, uh, sound recording company. And not, I, don't know if it, I don't think it was Deutsche Grammophon, but and he thought he had, he had 200,000 euros. He wanted to buy the back catalog recordings, and he was sure that they would say yes because they weren't selling any of them. None of them were in print, and they, in print. None of them were available. They hadn't sold a single copy of any of these recordings for 15 years. So they said, this is a no-brainer. They're just going to take, take my money and, and, and uh, pat me on the back and give me a glass of wine. Uh, and when he showed up, the, literally they said, we don't do any deals less than a million dollars, and just showed him the door. So there's $200,000 on the table. They won't even take it because their business model says only uh, deals more than a million dollars. Um, so in this situation, is it legitimate? I mean, could we have compulsory licensing for audiobooks? Because we, we have this solution in New York. Right? If you all want to do, if you go want to do a cover album of the Beatles' greatest hits, you can do it. You go to Harry Fox, you pay your fee, you can, you can record any Beatles song you want and sell as many copies, try to sell as many copies as you want. Um, why do we only do this with music? Why can't we solve this problem that pisses you, me off? You really uh, did want an argument, other... didn't you? Yeah, good. Um, so I'll refer back to something that Melvin Gibbs said on the last panel, and that's self-determination, right? The whole notion that this is a property right, and that, that under the Constitution, the idea is that that's what promotes the creation and dissemination in the first place. If you're gonna Take it away in music, if though? You, if you're going to recognize someone's right to make a good deal, you have to recognize their, their right to make a bad deal. Oh, or I know. Or, or, to, for, for, or not to know their own self-interest. It's not our position to determine what's best for them. If Paul McCartney wants his song to be used for some things and not others, that's his right. When we talk about compulsory licenses, I think we have to recognize that they're quite distorted. Um, what we're finding today, especially on the internet, is you don't need them, right? All those numbers that you saw on the screen about how many copies of movies and television shows are available online, none of that is done with a compulsory license. Millions and billions of views. This notion that, that in today's age, the transaction cost prevents people from entering into arrangements just isn't true. Cable programming is made available without a single compulsory license. Internet content is made available without a single compulsory license. What we are finding is that the compulsory licenses are inhibiting the ability to get content online. For example, broadcasters never had to get, when, when broadcast content is retransmitted over cable, there is a compulsory license. As a result, broadcasters, right, Broadcasters never had to secure the online rights when they aggregated content to be made available over broadcasting and cable. Now, when those broadcast networks want to move their content online, they're realizing, hey, I don't have the online rights. I never negotiated for those rights with a content owner. Now they have to go back, and now we have a problem. Now they are actually being, pro they're being prevented, they're inhibited from making content available online because of a compulsory license making them lazy. So I would encourage us not to move towards more compulsory licenses. The internet shows, and, and just even cable distribution of cable programming shows, they're not necessary to make content available to the public. Not even for audiobooks? <laughs> well, I mean, so, so the reality is, is that this is, a, this is a marketplace. And if someone isn't meeting an untapped need, someone's going to figure out, I can make money. They've made a bad business decision. I'm going to make the right business decision, either because I'm going to find a way to lower the transaction costs, to, to tailor the audience, to aggregate the audience, to use data, hopefully respecting privacy, to find that untapped market, and I'm going to serve them. And someone is going to make the right deal on the audiobooks. They're going to make a mint, and someone's going to rethink their bad business decision. But under a property rights regime, that's the way that conversation is supposed to go. Someone will clean up by making the right business decision that someone failed to see. So, I mean, you've identified you know, the existence of market failures. And I think the way you would deal with a market failure kind of depends on the market failure. Uh, some of them, maybe there is a market failure that does call for a compulsory license. And I would say the availability of works to uh, the disabled. If the rights holder is not doing it, I think there should be a compulsory license where someone can make it happen, even if the uh, creator strenuously objects. I mean, I think that the importance of accessibility is more important than the uh, right of the creator to veto that. Uh, there's other areas, though, where if it's just like, well, I think that this is too inconvenient or expensive, well, maybe I would not support a compulsory license in that case. Uh, but you could also just look to, instead of layering a new compulsory license on top of copyright law, look at copyright law, look at the actual substantive law. Uh, there's this tendency, we did it with software, where we said, oh, you know, we've decided that the operation of using a computer constitutes making a copy. 
But if you own the copy, then you get a statutory license. And if you're repairing the computer, you get a statutory license instead of, I think the more sane view is to say that operating a computer does not constitute a copyright triggering event. But we didn't do that way. We layered a bunch of compulsory license on top of it, and I think, uh, and I think that was the wrong solution to what may have been perceived as a market failure. Uh, and we have a hand. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, I think it's it, yeah, it's 15 minutes per question. Anybody except Mark? <laughs> oh, that's right. A student first. If there's any, we'll punish any student who's here by. Okay, so there's one student back there who actually. Phil, who drove me from the airport. Thank you, Phil. You get the first question. <laughs> this is very official all of a sudden. Um, I was just wondering. Um, it sounds like um, maybe I have the wrong impression of this to some degree, but um, it sounds like um, the onus is kind of on the copyright holder, the creator, to see that um, a violation is policed and uh, you know prosecuted, punished, whatever. Um, I'm wondering if um, whether in Congress or through any sort of you know DC organization, I'm wondering if there's an effort to more actively, you know, more kind of proactively pursue that um, in order to protect, you know, copyright holders and um, you know limit the sort of oversaturation of pirated works in the market. This came up in the last panel too. There, in particularly around the DMCA, there's a concern that the burden is in the wrong place. Um, it's not something that we are focused on. Um, as I mentioned, we're focusing really on the voluntary initiatives. But there are some that are looking at the safe harbors that have been granted and questioning whether so the idea of the safe harbor was it was supposed to encourage the very collaboration that we're now seeking in our voluntary initiatives efforts. And some believe that it has not created those voluntary initiatives, which is why we're now trying to get them started. Again, not our push, but some are questioning whether the DMCA safe harbor struck the right balance and whether it created too much of a burden on the content creator, but particularly the smaller artists who don't have the same resources that, say, larger creators do. And actually, let me just piggyback on that because that's a great segue for us. Um, as, some of, as one of the studies that Congress asked us to do at the end of the copyright review hearings, um, they did ask us to look at Section 512. So there is an outstanding study right now um, the notice of inquiry was issued February, yeah. I think. Um, we are seeking comment. If the comment period has closed, we will also be doing roundtables. Um, and so we are very much interested in hearing about how it's working. Um, and just to pivot a little bit, um, there are some other mechanisms for dealing with wide-scale infringement. Um, the DOJ does occasionally bring criminal cases against um, very, very large-scale criminal enterprises that are doing massive copyright infringement. Um, that doesn't necessarily have to be at the instigation of the owner. So there are other mechanisms out there, um, but the main one available, at least in the internet world, um, for the average creator is really the DMCA. Um, and it is under review. Yeah, and before we go, I see there's more questions. Just to piggyback on that, uh, from Congress's perspective, uh, with a lot of the you know hearings and, and meetings that we've had, uh, a lot of members think that it's been important to kind of listen to what the creators and everybody that that will be impacted kind of think about whether the incentives are still there uh, to work to create invention and or innovation. And so I think kind of what's been mentioned here is that a lot of smaller creators, as you heard from earlier panels, are kind of frustrated with uh, some of the way that the process has been working. But we've also heard on the other side uh, that there's people that think that you know the process is, is, working, is working well. So we're trying to balance both of those. But uh, as you can see from the conversation we're having, it's, it has been kind of uh, animated and difficult at times. I would just be very, uh, I'm very skeptical of ideas that we should change 
the obligations of an online service provider to match what YouTube might be capable of because the safe harbor laws apply to all online service providers, not just the large ones with significant financial resources. Uh, and I would just worry from, from a lot of perspectives, from a competitive standpoint, uh, from the idea that creators ought to have multiple different online services to use, not just these monopolistic ones, uh, of, cre of, of creating the obligations and layering them on so much that only the largest could afford to comply. Uh, Mark. Uh, so I want to go back to the compulsory license issue here. I mean, I, I, I am delighted that uh, transactions are occurring. I think that is exactly what you want to do. Uh, but it is worth noting that in this area, as in so many other areas throughout the history of copyright law, it was not property rights that generated the transactions, right? It was infringement on property rights that generated the transactions, uh, right? So um, uh, what happened uh, was not, hey, the content owner said, oh, cool, internet, new mechanism, new medium, let's get on it, let's start licensing, right? In fact, they did everything in their power to keep content off the internet for a number of years, right? What happened then was uh, a bunch of people put the stuff on the internet illegally. Uh, that turned out to be uh, uh, wildly popular, right? <laughs> and that drove uh, both discussions of uh, compulsory licenses, right, and also discussions of whether there's a way for the content owners to get uh, a share of the money from it. That's precisely what we saw happen with radio. It's what we saw happen with uh, cable television in the first instance. It's what we saw happen with satellite television in the first instance. All of those compulsory licenses arose because the copyright owner said, no, we will not do a deal with this new medium. The other, the responding uh, uh, companies, the new medium said, fine, we're going to go do it without permission. The courts said, okay, fine, you can do it without permission. And then Congress said, well, all right, how about a compromise? Uh, we'll let you in, uh, uh, but, uh, but you got to pay some money. If we can get to that compromise without a compulsory license, great, but I don't know that we can conclude that we ought to just wipe compulsory licenses off the face of the earth because we'll, we'll, uh, uh, we'll promise that we'll do a deal the next time a technology comes along. So I, I... <laughs> <laughs> give, give, give him the mic and, and a pair of boxing gloves. <laughs> because the fledgling cable industry, now represented by my behemoth friend Joe Waz next to me at Comcast, <laughs> uh, the sense was they could, it would be too complicated to try and license the rights to the shows on TV stations. So Congress, in its wisdom, gave cable and later satellite a free compulsory license for all the programs on local TV stations all across America. Now. They haven't given that right to Netflix or Amazon or any of the other online providers. And contrary to what Mark says, the, the owners of creative content have been stumbling over themselves to license their content online, movies and TV shows on Netflix and Amazon. But the existence of this compulsory license is inhibiting the ability of creators to put the broadcast content online uh, they don't, as, as Neil said, they historically didn't have the rights necessary to do that because of the existence of the compulsory license. You can't extend the compulsory license to online because of our international treaties that prohibit that. And the, the notion that in 2016, Comcast needs the largesse of a compulsory license to get programs is, excuse me, idiotic. Now, there's probably three members of Congress that even know this compulsory license exists. And my question to the panel is, why don't we just get rid of it? So, Any, I think this really highlights the problem of talking so broadly about compulsory licenses, yay or nay. Uh, because sometimes I, I think in the music context, I tend to lean favorable towards compulsory licenses given the nature of that market and how I see the potential pitfalls of not having a compulsory license. In the video contest, whether or not it was the right idea to have a compulsory license from 1976 to 1992, I think at 1992, the error was to layer on top of that 
the notion of retransmission consent, where we said, oh, cable companies do have to negotiate in a free market after all, but not from the copyright holder. And then I guess theoretically an economist could make an argument that money will eventually flow upstream to rights holders. There's just, you know, 10 middlemen in the way. And I think that it's a ridiculous system because we don't, it's not like you have a compulsory license that allows anyone to start up a cable company just by paying, you know, a nominal check. Instead, you still have to negotiate. It's just that we have this totally bizarre system. And I agree with Preston on that point. You know, I think I disagree with some of, uh, you know, my libertarian-leaning friends. I don't think you can just sort of cut it off instantly. I think, you know, to get rid of a, po a policy like this, you need to have a very long transition and blah, blah, blah. But nevertheless, like, I think that's an example of a compulsory license that evidence and facts have shown is probably not necessary. Uh, but I don't generalize from that to say that they're always unnecessary or that they can never be good because the facts of the markets matter and these markets are human constructions and we just deal with them on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, in the back, yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Well, speaking of crime, uh, <laughs> The Copyright Office creates quite a mafia industry of pornography, and I've tried to help thousands. Uh, it gave up. But there is a setup, uh, major lawsuits across where there's pornography, you know, that you click a box on your internet, and all of a sudden you're sued in a class action lawsuit. And I don't know how much the Copyright Office and the Congress knows about this, but I have gotten a few judges to at least try to separate these thousands of lawsuits and force people to file a thousand separate lawsuits instead of one class action. But I think you should realize that there's a huge amount of court recess and a lot of crooked lawyers making a good living setting up these pornography shops who then distribute and, and register, of course. The first step is register your pornography. It's a work of art. And I think that's perhaps where a congressional copyright handshake could be done even between Republicans and Democrats, because I, you know, if, if pornography dumps into your server, then you know you can trace who dumped it five thousand at a time and send a warning letter. Hey, you've violated my copyright. You know, I have this federal right, and I'm going to sue you. And in fact, I'm going to give you a chance to give you a ten or fifteen thousand dollar payoff before I make your name public, because right now you're a John Doe. So you may not know the extent of this mafia setup that the Copyright Office and lack of interest or whatever Congress has created, but what, what do you think about <laughs> pornography being a work of art? Um, I mean, I would say you have to talk to That's... the founders who wrote the First Amendment that said it's <coughs> protected speech. And as a government entity, we cannot come and say, you don't get a copyright because we don't like the speech. Um, obscene works are another matter. Um, but you know, as a government entity, if someone comes to us that, with something that has First Amendment value and it has a spark of originality and creativity, we register it. We, we have to. Are we on? OK. Um, so I want to know whether the government employees uh, in the room are at all worried about the private ordering that was described by Neil, which is essentially a, com uh, a private, it sounds to me anyway, like a private SOPA or PIPA that was largely rejected by a democratic movement two or three years ago, and Congress took it off the table, and now it appears to be a, a concerted effort by, he said, Chase and PayPal and YouTube and um, Google. I mean, I, I don't know who, I mean, it, it, that, I have to say, as somebody who like, worries, worries a lot about voting and having my voice heard, this feels like an end run around what Congress rejected. So he's not in the room, but I can tell you what one government official views. <laughs> Pre President Obama, in his administration at the time of SOPA, said, I quote, we expect and encourage all private parties, including both content creators and internet platform providers working together to adopt voluntary measures and best practices to reduce online privacy. These are just parties in the marketplace 
entering into agreements. And they can say, you know what, I don't want illegal conduct happening on my storefront. Right, but the point about the marketplace that you're making is that it sounds like everyone is free to make the same deal. But the whole, I mean, the conversation about welfare justice that we were having on the panel before is that not everyone can make the same deal. And so what you're doing is describing or a, a deal being made by pe people who are on, at arm's length transactions, but it's not, and it, but it's going to affect most of the people who participate on the internet and use it for both for both good or for ill for, for from, from accessing in, in, in these voluntary arrangements we're talking about from accessing very clearly right. and there pervasive is, there is no government activity. oversight in there's no government oversight in whether or not the deals that you are making are actually shutting off legal content or illegal content things that is a fair use or a not fair use i mean there's no way to know and that's why i asked i mean I, it was i it's a it's a real question sure. to the folks who um who are the le you know the legislators in sure. the room whether or not it worries you at all that those are the that that's what has happened because the, the democratic process didn't come out the way sure. the folks wanted it to. no i think it's a, a good question and and it's one that's been raised you know when we when the members went to different places for uh, discussions with different constituents. And I think um, kind of the way that it was explained, I mean, I've sat and listened to different senators and, and uh, members of Congress kind of talk with constituents about it. I think at the time, like you mentioned, uh, the previous bills or the legislation that was going through Congress, and then there was uh, you know, a lot of activation that happened and people had concerns about that legislation. And I think at the time, uh, opponents of the bills made arguments to members of Congress that we don't need legislation because these are things that we can do in the private sector. And so uh, I think the argument kind of cuts both ways because a lot of members that were supportive of those bills were thinking uh, they're never going to be able to work together because they disagree so fundamentally on basic principles about how the internet should work. Uh, as Neil had mentioned, um, you know, at the time there was a lot of internet companies that were saying there should be a follow the money approach. Uh, and at the time when that happened, that seemed like that would never happen because a lot of members of Congress were being having meetings with people that were saying, hey, look, there's a lot of money that's being made from this because of, you know, a lot of the payment processors and others are kind of turning a blind eye on some of these things that are happening because they're making a lot of money. And so they'll, have, they'll never have an incentive to kind of enter into these deals because everybody's kind of making money. So I think, uh, to answer your question, I think it's a good question in terms of, you know, we would never, speaking as a, a, a staffer for Congress, we would never want to see something that would be seen as like an end around to legislation, but at the same time, a lot of the arguments that were made opposing the legislation uh, were the ones that I think some of the private parties are trying to address. Now, if it turns out that uh, we see that the points that you raised um, turn out to be negative for uh, consumers and other people that raise concerns. At that point, if they come to Congress and they, they say to us, we don't like these voluntary agreements because basically what they're doing, like the example that you gave about how do we know if this is legitimate content or whatever, I think at that point, Congress would be interested in entertaining whether there are steps that we should take. But I can say that from the perspective of a lot of members, even people that were opposed to SOPA and other legislation, they're pleased to see these type of voluntary agreements because they think it's incurred. They want to see how it could work. And we're open, like, if, like the example that you gave, if there are specific instances that you are aware of or that you know of where this, these private agreements are being uh, you know, too strong or too heavy handed or cutting against what people oppose, we would like to hear about that. Um, but as Neil said, I think President Obama made it clear that he was open to, from an administration perspective, to seeing how those would develop. I get the last word, maybe. I blame Obama. No. <laughs> um, I'd add one thing. It, it matters who's, on the, who's around the bargaining table when there's a private agreement like this, because they're, they're proxies for the public interest around this table, right? The payment processing people want to process as many payments as possible. YouTube and eBay want as much stuff on their websites as possible. So it's, it's not like uh, at, at least right now, it doesn't look like a cartel where everybody has the same interest and the public's going to pay some sort of terrible price. There, there's at least a, a balance right now which makes me feel temporarily, you know, comfortable with what's going on. It is 5.30, Chris Daly. Should we, I'll let you 
wave us on our way.